At dinner parties up and down the land, people love to discuss property, and especially so in London and the London property market. So this week, we're giving it the attention it deserves. Episode 223 of the Property Podcast, looking at what's happening to the London property market. Yes, welcome to the podcast. If you don't know it by now, I am Rob D. He is Rob B. We are talking about what's happening to the London property market, and it's really interesting. You'll have seen headlines about this. You'll see more headlines about this in the year or two to come, I would say. But we've dug through the data to really find out what's going on. So at your next dinner party, you can have an intelligent point of view. And of course, you can make the right investments. Don't know which is most important. They're both important. Oh, it's definitely to get one up on your friends, Rob. Let's let's be honest. (laughs) Profit's good, but knowing more than your friends, it's it's always a little bit more satisfying. You can't put a price on that. So yes, that's coming up. We've got a great resource of the week for you as well. But let's kick it off, as is traditional, with a news story and a good news story this week for expats. So we have a lot of overseas listeners, lots of expats in the Middle East, Hong Kong, Australia, all kinds of places, all interested in investing in property in the UK and all really struggling with mortgage options. There are mortgages for expats, but it is a restricted selection. And the story this week is that that range has got a little bit less restricted. A new lender, Vida Home Loans, has come into the expat buy-to-let market. And it looks pretty competitive. So you can get a loan to value of up to 75%. You can get a maximum loan of a million quid. And you get rates from 3.89%. So this is definitely good news for expats. Hopefully, it's the first of more to come. And Rob, I think hopefully here we might be seeing something that we talk about a lot, which is lenders being competitive with each other, sort of see where the market's going, see where the demand is, and then try to carve out a little niche for themselves and meet that demand, which we've seen with limited companies and might be seeing here with expats. Yeah, I see the trend going that way. This is really positive news. I've seen, it's interesting, more people using Vida home loans recently just applications coming in and oh who's that client using vida it's like, oh they're obviously trying to get market share right now by offering really really competitive products so good news the trend is going the right way we said this would happen with limited company mortgages and that's great to see but it's also great to see that expats can get involved as well they did have a few products before but it's nice that there's competition opening up and it means that things will only get better now before we get into our main topic of the week we have to absolutely acknowledge the awful awful events at Grenfell Tower recently we're not going to talk about it too much because simply we don't know how to talk about a tragedy of that scale but we want to just acknowledge it especially when we're talking about London this week obviously our thoughts and I'm sure the thoughts of all podcast listeners are with the people who have been affected by that tragedy Um, but London is an incredible city Um, it's had a bad run recently but it's one of the most impressive and powerful cities in the world and I'm sure it will go from strength to strength in the future but we just want to acknowledge it here on the podcast So this is the Property Podcast. So let's talk property, Rob. What's our topic of the week? Yes, let's do that. So what is happening to the London property market? Well, to understand what's happening right now, we need to look at what's happened in the past. And then we're going to use all of that to project into the future and look at the important thing, which is what might happen next. A lot of this is taken from a home track study, um, which is really interesting. They've taken London property and they've split it up into deciles. So groups of 10% by price. So the most expensive 10%, then the next 10%, and so on and so on, all the way down. And when you break it up like that, you get some really interesting analysis coming out of it. So the link to that is going to be in the show notes, along with a few other links to the sources that we're using. Lots of really interesting stuff in there, as well as the link to the news story we were just talking about. So head over to the propertyhub.net slash London market, which are the show notes for this week. So let's kick off, Rob, with a bit of history and look at what's happened over the last eight years. Okay, so if we go back to the bottom of the market, which was 2009, so remember the crash happened in 08, but then it started to dip down. So from its rough low point, somewhere in 09, property prices in London have grown 80% over eight years. Very, very impressive growth. Now, across the board in London, in every price band, it's increased roughly by the same percentage, which is really interesting. But what's even more interesting is the timing of each area has been different. So, for example, the top 30% in London, so that's the, the, the high-end properties, the properties like West London, for example, they recovered from 2009 to 2012. 
And this was very much driven by overseas buyers and domestic residents who didn't need a mortgage or could get them easily. So basically, very wealthy people who could go up and buy prime London straight after an economic crash. Smart money, you could call it. So that's what went first. Yes, and it wasn't followed by the lower part of the market until 2013. So you had the top 30% starting its recovery in 2009 and running for about three years. And the lower sectors only grew strongly from 2013 onwards. Now, at first, that seems surprising. You think, well, you know, London is London. But actually, it is different forces at work. So as Rob said, the high-end property is driven by overseas buyers and sort of wealthy domestic residents. But then, of course, that rippled out. The ripple effect, which we've talked about before. Prices being pushed up there meant the people who would previously have bought there moved slightly further out. So the cheaper parts of town start to grow a little bit later once that ripple has kicked in. There are other factors in there as well. So there's confidence. The smart money has seen all this before. They know what's going to happen. Everyone else needs a little dose of confidence. It took a few years for that to kick in. And then there's also access to finance. So if you've got lots of capital, you can buy in cash and that's fine. For everyone else, you have to wait for mortgages to become more available. All of those things took until 2013 to really sort themselves out. So we didn't see that growth until later. So we'll talk later about what we can learn from all this. But early learning is like a general one about owning prime assets. If you own prime assets, they tend to grow first and they tend to grow more. Because as Rob said, Every price band has increased by the same percentage, but if you've got a more expensive property, that percentage is a percentage of a higher number. Therefore, the growth is higher in pounds terms overall. So that's what's happened. London has ended up growing by 80% across the board, but the timing is different and that's the important part. So that's what's happened. What's happening now? Well, interestingly, the top 10%, so the top, the very top end of the market, is falling by 5% a year right now. It's going down. And that's due to weaker demand. All the tax changes really hit that end of the market as well. Fears over the impact of Brexit and the London economy and the UK wider economy as a whole. That very top end of the market has really been hammered. And it's interesting to see that is actually dipping. The media hasn't really picked up on that yet. So that's interesting too. But that's possibly because the bottom 40% of the market is still growing by more than 5% year on year. But that number is slowing down. And at 5% growth overall in London, it makes it one of the five slowest growing cities in the UK right now. So it's done fantastically well, but right now, it's bottom of the class. And how many people are aware of that? There's this perception that London is always the powerhouse. Well, it's not always. At the moment, it's one of the slowest. But it's not just the prices. Rents are falling as well. This comes from a study by the letting agency Your Move um, that says new tenants in the capital are typically paying almost £100 a month less than their counterparts a year ago. And from agents and landlords who I've spoken to in London, just anecdotally, that seems to be the case from what we're seeing as well. So £100 a month cut in rents compared to a year ago. Why is that? Well, part of it is due to demand falling and part of it is due to supply increasing. There was a big spike, remember, a year ago before the stamp duty rates, the new stamp duty rates came in. That basically pulled purchases forward. So anyone who was thinking about buying a property in that, say, year went and did it in March to try to beat the April deadline. That meant a glut of properties coming onto the market. More supply obviously meant that rents went down. I mentioned demand falling as well. Um, Also, there is a study that showed that many of the people who are selling at the moment are moving out of the capital. There's a survey by Lonres where they talked to um, agents in London and almost half of those agents said that 10% or more of their vendor clients intended to quit the capital once they'd sold their property. So it's not just that people are selling to move up or move around London, they're actually moving out of London. So that could be where some of the decrease of demand is coming from. That's right, Rob. And I've moved out of London now. I'm one of those people who've moved out to one of the home counties because the value that you get is, even though prices have risen here over the last few years, is still exceptional compared to what you get to London. And for example, I can get a train into King's Cross in under 20 minutes and I live outside of London, so I can get into King's Cross quicker than people in zone three or four. But what I get for my money is far superior. So it's that natural ripple effect. People are seeing the value and that makes complete sense to me because where I live, for example, and that's a small area 
of the home counties. But where I live, the market is very buoyant. For sale signs are going up and sold signs are going on quite soon afterwards because people are taking that money and finding better value elsewhere. Yeah, exactly. It does just make sense. I think things reached a point where people were just like, well, this is silly. I can have such a better lifestyle if I just move further out. And like you say, if the transport links are right, which in many places there are, then you don't even have to compromise on that. Another thing that's happening, though, is that transaction volumes are very low. So you've talked about people moving out and people selling, but but actually, compared to historical numbers, not that many people are selling. Transactions are really low across the board, and in three London boroughs, they're at an all-time low. They're even lower now than they were in the depths of the last crash. Now, presumably, that's due to the stamp duty changes. People are going to be reluctant to buy because in London, stamp duty is a huge chunk. Like You could buy a nice flat in the north for just the price of your stamp duty bill in London. That's got to be one of the factors that's holding transactions down. So to round up what's happening now, you've got the most expensive properties falling You've got the bottom 40% of properties still growing, but that growth is slowing down, giving you 5% annual growth on average across London. You've got rents falling, you've got people moving out, and you've got a low transaction volume. So lots of really interesting things going on. Like you said, Rob, the media didn't really pick up on it. And a lot of these things might just not be what people expected would be going on, because there's this perception that London's always growing and always getting more popular. It is, and it's easy to see why, because... People have just latched onto a trend and it's harder to see the next trend happening. But what is happening? Let's look. It seems the general public don't want to do this, but we can. So Home Track predicts falls in the top 30% of the London market over the rest of the 2017. And Rob and I have talked about this in our predictions episode at the beginning of the year. This doesn't come as any shock to us as well. Remember, make sure you heard that correctly. It's not falls of 30%. It's the top 30% of the market um, to continue to go down. HomeTrack believe the remaining 70% of the market will be broadly flat. And you know what? Now we're six months in, and I've had to redo my kind of guesses at the beginning of the year, or I should say predictions, so I sound better. Um, I'd probably go closer to what HomeTrack have said. I don't think it's going to come down dramatically. And not that we said that in our predictions episode as well. You, you probably want to go back and listen to that now to see what we did say for a giggle. But 70% flat, I think, yeah, sounds about right. It also goes on to say that it's unlikely to see a rush for the exit and a quick correction, just a downward drift and some stagnation. And yeah, absolutely. We don't see a crash happening in, in London. Far from it. It's a weaker market in the short term. Longer term? Well, maybe we can look in the, the last cycle to find out longer term what this could do, but more on that later. Okay, so what lessons can we take away from this? So we know what's happening in London now. And so that means that if you're interested in buying in London, you can make smarter decisions. And that's really valuable. But we can generalize from that as well and look at what this tells us about property in general that you can apply to other markets at other times. First of all, I think a really important thing to take away from this is just because an area has performed best in the past doesn't mean that it's going to continue to. And we've said this before, there's this perception that London will always do best. Not the case. London will do extremely well at certain times. London over the long term is a great city and will always do well. But it doesn't mean that at every given point in time, it will be the best investment. That's why we've said to avoid London for the last few years, because you get poor yields and low growth. That's not always going to be the case, but it has been the case and is the case now. It also teaches us, as I mentioned earlier, that prime assets are more volatile. If you own a prime asset, so you've got like a nice central apartment, it will grow in price first and fastest as the cycle moves on, but it will also fall first and fastest when you get to the crunch. That's worth knowing. You can use this to your advantage. You can also stay out of the way if you don't want that roller coaster ride. If you want to take advantage of capital growth and play the cycle a bit, you can really use that. But if you'd rather just kind of collect a steady return over the years, you can look to other types of property that are more likely to just go along consistently and have a less amplified version of the cycle. And a third thing to take away, which is not a big surprise, but we've really seen a big effect of this, is that when you tax something, you get less of it. Obvious, but with stamp duty, wow, that seems to have had a major effect on London transactions. 
We can't say that the transaction volume being low is purely down to stamp duty, but there's a heck of a correlation there. But it does seem natural. It does seem like the stamp duty has got to such a level that it is a huge disincentive to buy. Yes, that stamp duty is pretty scary. So overall, we have to remember that property isn't immune to market forces. Rents and prices simply can't grow ahead of incomes forever. And affordability in London right now is ridiculously stretched. So if it stagnates, and that means in real terms it's falling, and we see wage growth, affordability can come under control without a major correction. And that's probably the more likely thing to play out in the short to medium term. Now, remember, listen to the podcast if you want to hear things first. So people are still talking about London as it was. We've talked about London as it was, as it is, which most people aren't talking about at all, but also the future. And next week's podcast, make sure you listen out for that one at the end of what exactly we're going to do. But it's kind of an unofficial two-parter, but next week's podcast will really get you excited, especially for those people who want to understand what's happened in market cycles before and therefore help us to predict what will happen in the future. So make sure you listen out at the end when we'll talk about next week's podcast. But this is definitely one of those podcasts where you have to go to the show notes. Loads and loads of links, loads and loads of sources for this podcast. Uh, you can tell Rob D's done this the notes for this one. So you can go to the propertyhub.net forward slash London market. That's the propertyhub.net forward slash London market. Loads of links, and also loads of links for the resource of the week as well, which is coming up after this wonderful review. And a huge thank you to Lorne DeHoy. I found the Property Podcast a couple of months ago, and I've been feasting on all the great information they've been providing ever since. What I like especially is that although I've not met either of them, they come across as being honest and sincere. They offer free training videos, and they're not trying to sell you courses for several thousands of pounds, and that their monthly meetups across the country are free. Thanks, Rob and Rob. You deserve all the success that comes your way. And also check out the Property Geek podcast. Well, thank you, Londa Hoy. Thank you very much. Rob, those courses for £1,000 sound, sound good, don't they? Yeah, maybe we just take what we've already got and slap a price tag on it. Seems like a pretty good idea. <laughs> no, we will not do that. No, we, don't worry. we will not. But thank you very much for that. And uh, don't meet us because that will shatter the illusion. But I'm glad that you're enjoying what we put out. <laughs> we're, we're best in audio. <laughs> Okay, let's have a resource of the week. And spookily, Rob, we've both installed a very similar resource on exactly the same week. We didn't know we were doing it. Clearly, we are in sync. People are going to start talking about us soon, Rob. (laughs) They probably are already, but after this, they definitely will. (laughs) Well, let's distract them by getting geeky. Um, So what this is, is a clipboard manager. This, This is super geeky, but I think you might find it more useful than you think. So you know when you copy something to the clipboard and then you paste it in somewhere else. The thing is, you can only have one thing in the clipboard. So if you paste it, then you paste something else and then you want to go back to the previous thing. It's like, ah, damn it. Then you have to go back and find the document that you cut it from in the first place, put it in the clipboard again. Maybe this is not a major frustration in your life, but it was a very minor frustration in my life for a long time. So I installed something called Jump Cut. It's a clipboard manager for Mac. And what it basically does is it gives you a clipboard history. So you can save like tens of things in there and you can go back through the history. So if there was something where an hour ago you had something useful in the clipboard, maybe it was an address, maybe it was a phone number, and you've since overwritten it, you can just go back into the history and paste it in again. So you don't have to go back and dig it out of where you had it in the first place. Uh, There are Windows alternatives as well that I haven't tried because I'm a Mac guy, but uh, the link will be in the show notes. And Rob, you've installed something for Chrome that achieves something similar, I believe. Yeah, very strangely, the same week I've gone installed, without talking about this before, an extension on Chrome. Chrome, we've talked about a lot. It's a great way for you to access the internet because there's all these wonderful extensions. An extension that does exactly the same thing. It's called Clipboard History 2. Very, very easy to use. You can dictate how long it saves them for. It, you can do all how many are saved at any one point. It's really, really good. Absolutely free. So check that out as well. But Rob, I'm still kind of shocked that we've both gone for the same resource without talking about it prior. So weird but there we go (laughs) (laughs) it is blooming odd but anyway as a result of that strange synchronicity you get two resources of the week this week so do go over to the show notes the property hub.net slash london market where you'll find those as well as everything else that we've talked about 
Indeed. Now, next week's episode, we've touched on a couple of times, and you can probably tell we're excited about this one. It's a history episode. It's full of data. No, don't worry. Don't worry. Please don't turn off yet. It's a really, really interesting topic, and hopefully we'll do it justice. But what we're going to do is we're actually going to go back to the last property cycle and look at the data. So a lot of people say, well, is London denying the 18-year property cycle? Is it doing its own thing? And we've never really had a what I've felt a good answer. We've had a kind of educated guess to why it's doing what it's doing. But when you look back at history, you become a lot more confident about the current cycle. So next week, we're going to go back through the data, pick out the key points of information that you need that will give you confidence to invest in the future. So as you can tell, we're super excited about that episode. So make sure you join us for that next week. Yep, I've seen Rob's spreadsheet that sparked this off, and it is exciting. <laughs> Depending on how excited you get by spreadsheets, but uh, there's going to be some good stuff to come out of it. We're not just going to sort of go and in cell C three, you'll see this. Uh, we, we we will actually pull some lessons out of it and just not read numbers at you. So that's going to be next Thursday. That's going to be a good one. We'll see you before then, though, with Ask Rob and Rob on Tuesday. Until then, though, enjoy whatever you're up to. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to the Property Podcast. For show notes, all our past episodes, and to leave a review, go to thepropertyhub.net slash podcast. 